Well, hello. Today I'm going to be talking about why I quit caffeine, what inspired me to quit caffeine, and the health benefits that I've experienced as a result. I'm going to be really focused on sharing this information thoughtfully with you, so I'm not going to be talking about any of the makeup, but I will leave all the details in the description box below. I'll use a few products I haven't shown on camera in a while, and also I made this palette from JD Glow and Give Me Glow Cosmetics. And I've literally never used a single one of these since I purchased it around Christmas time. So we're gonna have some fun with this today. And I forgot to put my jewelry on, so we're just gonna start chatting while I do that. I love these little casual videos. I'm not a doctor nor a medical professional, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. I took verbatim notes on this book that I'm reading so I could share the information with you accurately. But of course, talk to your doctor if you wanna make any changes to your lifestyle. Okay, real quick, I'm gonna apply the Rode Peptide Lip Treatment, which I am absolutely obsessed with because it's nice and thick and cushiony. Sadly, all the Rode products are still out of stock and I will be doing a Rode video soon, so stay tuned for that. Okay, I'm gonna start with just a tiny bit of a backstory before we get into talking about specifics of caffeine. I've been a coffee drinker for as long as I can remember. I'm the kind of girl who would have two cups a day. Generally, I would have like four espresso shots and a coffee. And I always felt that I needed caffeine because I've suffered from mild insomnia my whole life. I mean, even with the best sleep habits, the best diet, the best lifestyle factors, working out, everything, I still, it generally takes me about two hours to fall asleep every night. And the reason I started questioning caffeine and its effect on my body was actually because of a subscriber. And if this was you, please tell me who you are because I want to personally and publicly thank you for this information. I shared on Instagram and YouTube that I had stopped taking hormonal birth control in about uh, mid-February of this year because John and I are preparing to freeze our embryos in the winter time or the fall. And you have to stop hormonal birth control in order to go about that process of freezing your eggs or freezing your embryos. And side note, if you want a whole other chatty get ready with me video on that topic of freezing our embryos, I'm totally happy to share why we're doing it, what the process is like, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially, I was on hormonal birth control for 16 years. I was okay for the first month. I was like, whoo, I'm in the clear, we're good. And then everything hit me like a ton of bricks. I started experiencing like crippling depression the week before my period, so when I would be PMSing. And I've never had any kind of chemical depression before. I've had, you know, situational depression where something really terrible happens and you're dealing with that but I've never had a depression that just came out of nowhere for no reason. I was also getting really bad cramps the first day of my period. And as you can see today, uh, I was getting and I still get hormonal breakouts. And a lovely subscriber suggested that I check out an author, uh, Alyssa Vitti. I don't know if that's how you pronounce her name, but it's A-L-I-S-A -S -S -A, and the last name is V-I-T-T-I. -T -T -I. And when I did, I discovered life-changing information. I started with two interviews. Um, so she has interviews on some huge YouTube channels, Hannah Bronfman and Women of Impact. Both interviews I will leave in the description box below if you are a person with a menstrual cycle, you gotta watch these. She also has a book and an app, but I'll get into that a little bit later. So essentially in all of her interviews and in the book, um, Alyssa or Alisa makes the argument that all health and lifestyle and medical studies are based on male bodies. And women, which is intended to be used inclusively, meaning if you are a woman with a uterus and a menstrual cycle, trans or non-binary, anyone who has an active menstrual cycle, this information is for you. But if that's not you, you probably know someone who has a menstrual cycle, so this information can still be really helpful for you. People with menstrual cycles have different hormones, which means we have different needs in terms of diet, exercise, um, productivity, sex, lifestyle factors, sleep, all of it. And her whole life's work is about how you can optimize the four phases of your cycle. So you have like follicular, ovulatory, luteal, and menstrual phases. And each phase essentially requires a totally different plan. Basically, she says in the Hannah Bronfman interview, if you are a person with a menstrual cycle, caffeine stresses your adrenals, increases your cortisol levels, the stress hormone, and that can actually cause depression before your period or just depression in general. So that instantly perked my ears up. I was like, Okay, interesting, I drink a lot of caffeine, I'm experiencing PMS depression, like, hmm, maybe worth a shot. Now, she totally says there are incredible cognitive benefits of caffeine, and that's undeniable, but she recommends that only for men or if you are postmenopausal. So she says, if you're someone with a menstrual cycle and then you're postmenopausal, you should add caffeine back in to get those cognitive benefits. But 
The negative aspects of caffeine are actually pretty astounding. It can impact fertility. So I was first and foremost shocked to hear about uh, caffeine impacting fertility in all people. And that's relevant for us, obviously, as we are going to be freezing our embryos uh, in the fall and winter time. So I was like, all right, cool. Already I have these two reasons to just try quitting caffeine for the time being and see how I feel. And before going into the rest of the research about caffeine's impact on people with menstrual cycles, I'm gonna tell you this right now, I have had zero depression symptoms ever since I quit caffeine. Not gonna drag it out, I just wanna tell you that right now, it completely stopped. And it stopped within a day. <laughs> like, it was a massive, night and day difference. Despite my reliance on caffeine, luckily I did not experience any withdrawal symptoms, but she does say if you do, you can totally just wean yourself off of it very, very slowly. So, you know, if you drink two cups of coffee a day, maybe take it down to one and a half or just one cup of coffee in a day. And after that, like, you know, if you're someone like me who loves espresso, going from four shots to three shots to two to one, or maybe doing half decaf, half regular, that kind of thing, like slowly weaning yourself off so you don't have those withdrawal symptoms, those headaches, and then you get really discouraged. Luckily, I was able to go cold turkey because I was really, really sick of the depression, and I purchased the two recommendations she has that kind of act as coffee substitutes for her. And by the way, when I'm talking about caffeine, uh, she means all caffeine. Green tea, black tea, coffee, matcha, energy drinks, all of it. So not just coffee, this is all caffeine. And again, there are amazing benefits of caffeinated teas like, you know, green tea and matcha with its antioxidants. However, there is also a negative aspect because of the caffeine that's in those teas. So just take everything with a grain of salt and do what's best for you. So I bought the coffee alternative that she recommended, which is called Kukicha tea. And I'll link it down below. I just buy mine on Amazon. It's great. It's like a toasted twig tea. So it's really dark and it tastes really nutty. So it kind of, you know, is supposed to help substitute coffee. It tastes like tea to me. It does not act or taste like coffee, but I really, really like it. And she likes it because it has the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest little bit of caffeine, so small that it's not gonna stress your adrenals, but it still kind of gives you that effect like you're having your morning coffee. I also was suckered in by TikTok ads and I bought the mud water coffee alternative. It's basically like a bunch of different mushrooms and then it has like cinnamon, turmeric, black pepper, and it has a little bit of chai, so it has one seventh the caffeine of coffee, and that has been totally fine for me. Zero depression, all of the other health benefits I've seen from quitting caffeine, I can still drink the tiny, tiny, tiny amount of caffeine in mud water and kukicha twig tea and feel great. And as someone who's been drinking coffee their entire life, I'm just shocked that I'm not just okay with not drinking it, but I'm actually thriving. By the way, I'm taking the Victoria Beckham Cream Blush in mini skirt because I haven't used it in a long time with my little wet and wild stipple brush. So I, like I said, I've had insomnia for my entire life since I was a child. I feel like my entire childhood and teenage years and in my early 20s, I only got like maybe five, maximum six hours of sleep a night. Let me tell you, now that I've quit caffeine, I spring out of bed in the morning. I'm like, doop, 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 gonna start my day. The birds are chirping, like very much not me. It's an absolutely weird situation to be in now. I feel like it's not even myself. It's so good in the morning. If you struggle with insomnia like I do, try quitting caffeine because it's really made a huge difference in my life. So now that you know the positive impacts of how quitting caffeine has changed my life, I'm gonna tell you the information about why it could be potentially negative for you or someone that you love. Alyssa says that not everyone can properly metabolize caffeine, and I'm one of those people. So if you're the kind of person who can have a cup of coffee or an espresso after dinner and then go to bed, you can metabolize caffeine. I'm not that person. If I have any kind of caffeine after like 12.30 p.m., I'll be up for hours trying to go to sleep. And there's actually a potentially serious issue that happens if you can't metabolize caffeine and you keep drinking it. Your body is not able to take in the nutrition that you're giving it. Aha, I did write it down. So your genes impact your ability to metabolize caffeine safely. It's the gene CYP1A2, which is the liver. Less than half of the population can metabolize caffeine properly and that gene is aligned with the body's ability to process estrogen. So she goes on to say that caffeine depletes micronutrients that are essential for hormone balance and the acidity in coffee in particular can alter the microbiome. So even if you're eating super healthy, your body may not be able to process it. She said that one specifically for coffee. She used the word coffee, not caffeine. So I'm being very careful with 
what I'm conveying here. That's why I took such, um, such vigorous notes. So I can tell that I'm the kind of person who doesn't metabolize coffee. I can tell that after I have coffee, I oftentimes get a stomach ache, but I just love the way caffeine makes me feel. I would use it so I could take a big old poop in the morning. Like, we all love it. <laughs> Let's not deny it, we all do it. But again, around half the population can metabolize caffeine, so that's great. So if you're the kind of person who gets like a stomach ache or anxiety or premenstrual depression, or you have insomnia, you might be someone who can't metabolize caffeine. And so you may wanna try quitting and just seeing what happens. She also says that caffeine can lead to the development of ovarian cysts and breast lumps. And that's something I'm very concerned about because I uh, have a lump that I've been monitoring my whole life that's like pretty painful and hard. Luckily it's never changed in size, but I do have pretty lumpy boobs. And so that's something that I am concerned about. And she also says that you don't have to think about it as just like a lifetime ban. She basically says like, if this is something you're concerned about, just try cutting it out during your luteal and your menstrual phase, meaning the week before your period when you would be like PMSing in the week of your period. Try just quitting caffeine then. It's safer for you to do so and drink uh, caffeine during your follicular and your ovulatory phases. But for me, now that I know how much better I feel without caffeine, I'm not going back. Real quick, I need to show you the magic of this Fit Glow setting powder. They just had a 30% off sale. I already showed this in a YouTube shorts recently, um, but you can always use my permanent coupon code Kate 20 for 20% off. Let's just look at the magic of this powder. Watch my cheek. This side versus this side. So blurring. And it actually controls my shine for like several hours. No powder has been able to do that. Like when I'm wearing makeup, my oil comes through even though I have dry skin, it's kind of a weird thing. Now let's move on to some of the more general and also some of the more important information in the book. So I am reading the book in the flow. I'm listening to it on Audible and I'm about halfway through and there is so much information that has clicked in me. Things I've thought about my whole life and wondered and just felt like something was wrong and now I get why. The whole thesis of her book, her research, her life's work is that all these different studies are based on male bodies. So intermittent fasting, keto, early bedtimes, eating the same thing every day, all that's based on men. And it makes sense to me because I was one of the people who tried keto and I was like sick from it, like truly felt sick. You know, her whole argument is that like, it's not good for a lot of women. And so that was really interesting to me because my whole life I've tried to follow so many biohacking trends and I just was never able to do it. And she goes into a whole psychological phase about like, what that does is it tells women that we're failures. When we try all of these things that are meant to be so fantastic and healthy and you'll feel amazing and you'll look amazing and blah, 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 blah. We then tell ourselves that we're failures or that we didn't have the willpower to stick with it. So it's really nice that she just gives you permission to get rid of that mentality. And take everything I say with a grain of salt. There's a lot more information in the book. She goes in to say like there are several different ways you can do keto. If you're a woman or a person that has a menstrual cycle, you just have to adjust it for where you're at in your specific cycle. And that makes sense to me. She talks about certain lifestyle habits, like the 3 p.m. happy hour. That was created because men's testosterone drops at 3 p.m. Women are built differently. So the happy hour thing doesn't necessarily work for us. She does have an app called My Flow. And I know right now a lot of people are very concerned about period trackers. And I do believe that there are certain privacy policies in place, but to each their own. So you input your cycle dates and you even can input what symptoms you're having. So if you are having hormonal acne, if you're having cramps, back pain, um, if your periods are super short or super long, what that means, what the color of your blood is, what that means. And she actually gives you a plan of like, okay, during this phase, you need to be eating more vitamin B or you might be experiencing breakouts because you have a lack of blah, blah, blah. So you can get like actual, like in real time help in terms of what symptoms that you're having. And I'm sure a lot of people are not gonna like this, but her whole argument is that people with menstrual cycles should never have PMS symptoms. She says that with her plan, she can cure endometriitis, PCOS, all of that, because she was a PCOS sufferer. And her doctors basically said to her, you know, decades ago, there's nothing that we can do for you. And she said, well, I'm not gonna take that as an answer. When I heard that, I first got this feeling of like, I didn't like that. I didn't like hearing like, I can just cure PCOS and endometriitis and all 
PMS symptoms with nutrition. Like that, that seems very gaslighty because as me, as someone who's had a chronic illness, um, which we are 90% sure is EDS, I get really sick of people saying, well, if you just strengthen your core, your pain will go away and blah, 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 blah. I don't like when I can hear people saying something really simple or seemingly simple as a way to cure something that is very severe. So I'm sure that maybe some of you had that initial gut reaction too, but read the book, give it a shot, and then get back to me. I'm not telling you what is fact and what is not. I'm just sharing what I'm reading, you know? But her whole argument is that you should be able to cure all PMS symptoms with these quite simple diet and lifestyle changes. And obviously for me, having just adjusted a couple things, I feel healthier than ever. And so I'm like, all right, keep talking, girl. And in the app, when you click on where you're at in your cycle, it'll tell you even what kind of work is best for you. Certain phases of your cycle is better for you to be doing just like grinding out to-do lists, you know, checking things off the list, being super organized. Other phases are better for deep work. Other phases are better for being social. So doing any speaking engagements, she breaks it all down on like a science and a hormone level of why you should adjust certain things to optimize your cycle. I haven't done all of that yet because honestly, I feel pretty good now that I've made those adjustments aside from my chronic illness and what happens because of that, but that's a whole separate thing. She'll say, you know, while you have your period, you shouldn't be doing your high intensity interval training workouts. You should kind of cool it on the marathon training. Instead, schedule in naps, focus on stretching and mobility, do light yoga, things like that, go for a walk. Whereas in the beginning of your cycle, you have a lot more energy. So she says that's the time when you want to do your high intensity interval training, hot yoga, your strength training and things like that. Like she breaks everything down and you can read it all in the PDF that comes with the book. They make it super easy. Before we get to the glittery eyeshadow, let me just read you some crazy information. 75% of autoimmune diseases are in women. Most diet and productivity trends are only studied in men. Diseases that affect women get less funding for research. Um, and obviously when you talk about then like black women or trans women, the research is even less. Women are twice as likely as men to have chronic illnesses. Two thirds of women make up Alzheimer's patients. Women experience depression twice as much as men. Men designed the corporate structure and happy hour to reflect their hormones, meaning they have workouts and their power meetings first thing in the morning when their bodies have the most testosterone. Then they have their happy hour at 3 p.m. when their body's testosterone drops off the most. Here's some cool stuff though. Women's brains have stronger networks that foster communication, emotional memory, anger, suppression, and intuition. We have a larger prefrontal cortex, which assists in planning, judgment, and organization. And that is associated with an uptick in empathy, impulse control, controlled risk-taking and focus. It develops faster in females, so that's why everyone says young girls seem more mature. The hippocampus is larger in women, which explains why we never forget a conversation, a wedding anniversary, first date, etc. We have a smaller amygdala, which points to an ability to diffuse tense situations and avoid a brawl. We have bigger insula, which houses gut feelings, so we have a higher ability to listen to our intuition. We have a bigger anterior cingulate, which has to do with decision-making and anxiety. We worry more than men and we take more time to make decisions. We have a bigger corpus callosum, which allows us to harness the power of more regions in our brain when we solve problems. And right here in my notes is where I left off reading the book. Um, but the last thing I wrote down is the gut houses 90% of the body's serotonin. Let's move on to some glittery eyeshadow. All right, I'm gonna lay down some Fit Glow concealer on my lids just so that the very, very foiled shadows have something to stick to. So anyways, this book is just life-changing and you know, on a psychological level, I would get really frustrated when certain biohacking trends didn't work for me. It really did make me feel like a failure. So I wanted to share this information beyond just the caffeine part, because I think this could also help a lot of people mentally. I will say there is one negative aspect to me of the book that I really don't like. It's a little soft science-y. And also there's a whole section about non-toxic living and clean beauty. When she says stuff like, there are so many bad chemicals that are disrupting your hormones, 
I'm like, yeah, water is a chemical. It's the poison that makes the dose. Water can be poisonous if you are drinking several gallons a day. That's a fact. So marketing is hugely involved in clean beauty and there are a lot of aspects that I do believe in and there are a lot of people that actually do have legit allergies or people that do need to avoid certain things. But generally the whole clean beauty, non-toxic movement is very much based on fear mongering that I don't respect. And a lot of it is people who've interpreted studies that don't have any background in science. While I think there are certain aspects of that movement that are very positive, there are also a lot of aspects to me that are very negative. So. That was something that I didn't really appreciate in the book and I did want to share it with you. But the rest of the book so far has not been really fear mongery at all. It's more so been really positive, really validating. And since I've made these own adjustments, I've felt 10 times better than I was a few months ago. I'm terrified right now because I don't like having to take things out of palettes. This is Give Me Glow Pajamas Foiled Pressed Pigment. I took the smallest dot. Wow. Yeah. Waza. That is pigmented. And all these shadows were like five bucks. I really do agree with her that it's a crime that everything is based off of men. That just seems so ridiculous. And now that I know this, I'm like, how am I only just hearing about this information in my 30s? Everyone should know this stuff. Every doctor should know this stuff. And now that I know what I know, I'm like, we really need to do more research on women and or people with menstrual cycles, you know? I do have some fallout, so I'm gonna try taking some tape under my eyes. Also, I'm just gonna like, Oh, so note to self, do eyes before base makeup next time I use these shadows. Cool, so pajamas is beautiful. I think we can all agree that I need to use these more. I just hope that this information can help someone else out there who's been struggling with the same thing. But if you feel great, if you sleep really well, you know, you don't have PMS symptoms or depression or anything like that, then it's probably not something you need to read. So yeah, what do you guys think of all of this? I'm very curious to know your thoughts. I'm also very scared to know your thoughts because people can be really angry when it comes to like health stuff and medical stuff. But again, I'm just relaying what I'm learning and what I'm reading. Okay, I brought down a couple lip options. One, I have MAC Business Casual. I think it might take away from the eyes a little bit. I also have Merit Slip, more of a yellow brown. I love this formula. That's it, that's the final look. You know, whether this information is relevant to everyone or not, I do think it's important to share these kinds of things so that maybe it helps someone else because the subscriber who told me to check her out changed my life. So if I can change somebody else's and pay that forward, then that's all I can hope for. My next video is gonna be all about affordable beauty. It'll be my favorites across affordable makeup and skincare. So stay tuned for that one. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.